So here we are. It is the worst part of the month of December right now, isn't it? It's not the, yippee, it's December, we get to decorate. Christmas is going to come part of this month. No, we're, we're past that. We're not yet to that part of the month when we get to start going to Christmas parties and, and all the shopping is done. No, here we are right in the middle of the month. This is the part of the month when we realize it's cold. Ah! And you got to figure out how to put your scarf on again, how you used to wear it. And it, it's, that, it's the time of the month in December when all the fun shopping is done and the only people left on your shopping list are the people that are hard to buy for and you're looking at them thinking, oh, what am I going to get for them this year? Hmm. That's where we are, the middle of the month of December. Don't exactly like it, don't know how you feel, that's where I'm at. That's uh, not my favorite time of this month. We're not only in the middle of December, we're also in the middle of Advent, which I view with about the same attitude. It's not the beginning of Advent, yippee, we get to put the tree up. It's not the end of Advent, we're not anywhere near the, the silent and still mystery of the Christmas Eve service. No, here we are, smack dab in the center. I always think Advent's about one week too long, and here we are on that Sunday I'm never quite sure what to do with. There are some early traditions in the church where uh, Advent is six Sundays long, and thank God that didn't keep. Four Sundays is about as much as I ever want to deal with. But So here we are in the middle of uh, December, in the middle of, of Advent, and we have this time uh, to prepare. That's really what we're at right now, right? We, in the middle of December, we, we have this moment where we... We're here preparing for all the things that are going to happen down the road. We're, we're preparing for guests to come, so we got to get our, our guest room clean, right? We're preparing to exchange gifts, we got to finish up our shopping. We're preparing for the Christmas feast, looking for good sales on hams, stocking up the pantry. But preparing in the sense of Advent, what, what are we doing with that? What are we preparing for here at the, the church? We're preparing for the birth of Jesus. And to prepare for that, the way we do so, we, we turn to John the Baptist. And what John the Baptist tells us to do to prepare is to repent. That's what he comes back to. He's kind of a, a Johnny One note. He comes back to that again and again and again. Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, for the Messiah is coming. Repent and be baptism. He just keeps on hitting that again and again and again. Repent is the way we get ready for Christmas. That's what we're doing right now here in the middle of Advent. It's how we prepare for the real fun that is yet to come. So what does it mean to repent? Literally, the word means to turn and be renewed. To turn away from sin, to turn away from isn't what isn't working, to turn away from the attitudes, actions, and habits that are, are sinful, that draw us away from God. And, and to turn... To, it involves acknowledging that we have something to turn from. That we are all sinners, we all fall short, we all hurt others at times. And to turn to God and expect God to be able to make a difference. Now, if we're going to break that down, we can get a little bit more practical and say that to repent is first to feel real remorse that we have sinned. To feel real remorse, a sincere regret that, uh, you know, I have messed up. And it's hard to pin down exactly what it looks like, but you know it when you see it, don't you? When someone's kind of given a fake apology and they really don't mean it, you, you, you know real, real remorse when you see someone's eyes and they go, yeah, they, they kind of, ugh, they get it. And then after remorse comes uh, penance and trying to make it right, trying to fix what's broken, whether it's a broken dish or broken trust. The penance is the sort of second piece of repentance. So in repentance first you say, I'm, I messed up and mean it. Then you, you try to make it right to do what you can to, to fix what's wrong. And then the last sort of step that closes off repentance is, is to try to live and to begin to live in a new way and be, be, again be accepted as part of, of the community. To, to sort of admit you're wrong, to try to make it right, and then to be welcomed back to the family table as one who has made, attempted to change what it has been, uh, what, what was wrong. And so that's repentance. That's how we're preparing for Jesus. And it probably is an activity best suited to this time of year when it gets dark a little bit too early and uh, we have time to, to sit and have a cup of coffee and to think and reflect and to pray. Having said that, it's something we have to work at because it's not something our culture does well. Our culture really is horrible at repentance. If you think about it, 
take those three parts of repentance. First, showing real remorse and apologizing. How often do you see someone being interviewed on TV and they're apologizing in sort of a quasi-apology, a, a semi-apology, it's not a real apology, mistakes were made, that type of apology? Uh, prime example of this, if you want to watch something frustrating, I went back and watched Jonathan Edwards' interview after his political career blew apart at the seams. It was really hard to watch because he kept on saying, I made a mistake, I made a mistake, I made a mistake. No, you did not make a mistake. You sinned against your wife by having an affair. That was wrong. That was sin. That wasn't a mistake. And so we don't do very, a very good job just flat, flat out saying, I was wrong and meaning it. And not only that, we, we as a culture, we struggle to not only say I was wrong, but then try to then pay the consequences for it, the penance. Try to make it right and acknowledge there are consequences to our sin. Another political figure demonstrates this nicely. Anthony Weiner. His political career, career blew up in some... Uh, how shall, how shall I put this? A, tech, a technologically driven mistake, shall we say. And, um, you know, the guy has some guts. I know that because he went from being senator just recently, and then what does he do? What, what did he try to do this last year? He ran for mayor of New York. There's a guy who doesn't understand that when you sin, there are consequences. And part of repentance is paying those consequences and trying to make it right. And for him to run for mayor of New York right after his, well, right actually in the midst of further revelations about his very own self, show that he didn't understand penance. When it's wrong, it's wrong. It's got to use our consequences. And then that is the third step that our culture really messes up. I mean, you admit you're wrong and you mean it. You pay for the sins and you make it right as much as you can. It's this third part of come, being welcomed back to the table and saying you've made it right and here we'll, we'll pick back up. It's this third step that we do worst of all. Because once you're a sinner in this culture, once you've confessed, once you've repented, once you've gone on TV and, and done the interview where you said mistakes were made, then, then you end up being marked, right? You'll never be accepted again. And I'll tell you, Paula Dean, I miss Paula Dean. Isn't she an example of that? Paula Dean said something stupid didn't she? She said, made a racist comment. Was it stupid? Yeah. Did she get on, she went on air and she, she had remorse. She apologized. It was stupid. She meant it. And she paid for it, right? She, she lost her show and, and, and now where'd she go? Has she been allowed to sort no, no, she, she's gone poof. And, and, and I, I miss Paula Dean. I have all this butter in my fridge I don't know what to do with. And Paula Dean could tell me, I'm certain. And, and so we, and, and I think it's this last part because we do such a bad job, job of accepting people back when they have sinned. I think that's why we, we're afraid to begin to repent. If you're afraid that once you have acknowledged you're anything less than perfect, once you acknowledge that, if you're afraid that you'll never be welcomed back in, are you going to acknowledge it unless you're forced to? Well, not really. And then you're going to dance as much as you possibly can. And so we as a culture don't do that well. And the reason that is, is because we as a culture don't fully believe that God can change lives. Right? When it comes to culture, our culture doesn't believe that people can change. And if you repent, if Paula Dean is a racist, our culture doesn't believe you can ever change. She has made a racist comment, and that's it. She will never be able to be different. And we know something very different here. We know that when we repent, what we are doing is turning to God and saying, I messed this up, and I'm going to pay for it, and I need your help with it to be made right. We know that with God, lives can change and do change. That once a racist, not always a racist, lives can change. Now, once you've done something stupid, no one is as bad as their worst sin, as their worst mistake. We know that in Jesus Christ, lives change. And so repentance is not some sort of acknowledgement that we're broken that you only do when you have to. Repentance is a way of life, of turning to God again and again and saying, this is something broken, can you help me make it better? This is something broken, and with you, it can be made better. And so we come to this middle of December, this middle of Advent, as we do every year, and this is the time to practice this art of repentance. To look around at our lives and say, 
Is there something here that I need to offer to God that's broken, that I need to, to turn away from and, and, and to, to pay some consequences for and, and to offer to God and say, I need your help with this. And, and there almost always is. And, and what I often see is it's not any one particular event, but it often is, is an attitude, a quickness to anger, a slowness to forgive, a quickness to judge, a slowness to listen. A habit that we once thought was no big deal that upon reflection we realize is a big deal. A way of speech, a tone of voice that we never intended to offend that does and we need to tame. We take this time in the middle of Advent to repent, not so that we can beat ourselves up for being less than perfect, but so that we can find what it is that is not perfect and offer it to the one who is. Offer it to Jesus, whose birth we're going to celebrate, who makes it possible for us to be perfected in the love of Jesus Christ. And so... Let's say you go home, you sit down with your cup of coffee when it gets dark earlier than it really should, and you, you ponder and you think, and you realize, I don't have anything I really need to repent of at this moment. I, you know, I think I'm doing okay. Here's the other half of repentance then I'd offer you as something to think on. For me to repent means that I've got to trust you that when I'm done with the repentance, I, I, I confess and I, I am remorseful and I, I try to make it right and, and I try to begin to live this new life by the grace of God. I need to trust that on, on the other side of repentance, you're going to accept me back in. And, and so that might be something to chew on. Not only do I need to repent, but how do I need to think about how can I allow other people to repent? Do other people know that if they tell me how they've messed up, that I'm still going to love them and walk with them and accept them at my table as they work through this, as they accept God's good news about this? And, and especially knowing that repentance is never some sort of generic, oh, I'm a sinner. No, repentance is of a specific sin. I have done this. And I, need, and I need to express remorse and I need your help with it and, and, and can, can we continue to love each other through repentance so that no one's afraid that if they admit how they're messed up that they're not going to be accepted here. That's the, the sort of the, the test of how well we can allow each other to change as a church. Now I had this, this ending all lined up and, and, and I had it all lined up and I, I was going to wrap this all up right here and then I turned on uh, a British comedian last night as I was driving home. He, John Oliver, he's on The Daily Show. He, he told about Nelson Mandela and he told something that completely messed with my head and, and I just have, had to ditch everything I've written here because I, I have to tell you about this. No, when John Oliver, you know how on a lot of late night shows they'll, uh, they'll go do man on the street interviews and they'll ask a question to get a response? He, he did that. John Oliver did this in South Africa a couple years ago. And, and he, the question they asked, they asked it of 50 people. Why are there any white people still alive in South Africa? After years of apartheid, why didn't you just kill them all? He had 50 black people in South Africa. That's what they asked. And they were looking for like something funny to use on TV and they didn't find anything funny. Because to a person, this is what they said. Nelson Mandela told us we have to forgive them and so we do. Okay. It, that didn't make the air. I'm sure that story is not being passed around the media because it's what didn't make the cut because it wasn't funny. But it got me thinking about Nelson Mandela. And I'll tell you something about Nelson Mandela and, and, and many great leaders. We see them when they are the great leader, right? We see Nelson Mandela as this elder statesman, the father of the nation. We see him as he has been in the last decades. What we often forget is how he got there how leaders get to where they, they become these great leaders. And I need to tell you that story. Because when Nelson, Nelson Mandela began, he was a, a small child. He was one of many children. His father had multiple wives. And, and the, the 
Nelson Mandela's mother sent him off, uh, among all the children, Nelson was sent off to a Methodist church for schooling. And uh, that's actually where he was given the name Nelson. His, his f real first name I can't pronounce, so I'm not going to try. But uh, his teacher said, now you're Nelson. Okay, now he's Nelson. And so he was uh, raised in this Methodist church and he became part of the African National Congress as a young man. And the African National Congress was sort of this very sedate, staid, sort of, we'll work against apartheid, but don't ruffle any feathers. And he became part of the youth ANC, uh, uh, the sort of young firebrand part of the ANC, that they were the group, they went off and got guerrilla training. They were getting ready to use bombs, to start blowing things up to challenge apartheid, and the plan was not to hurt anyone and, and blow things up when no one was there, but you know, you start blowing up bombs and, well, M Nelson Mandela was put on America's terrorist watch list for good reason. And then he goes to trial, and he is sentenced to a lifetime in prison because he will not renounce this violence. That's part of it. I mean, a small part of it, but that's still part of it. And he goes in to prison as a follower of Jesus who will use violence. 27 years later, 27 years of worship in the prison, of service, of hard labor in the prison, uh, one of my teachers at, at Duke was his chaplain, was Nelson Mandela's chaplain on Robben Island. So I know that they were worshiping there. And I know that they were coming to realizations like you can look out the window of the jail and you can either see the bars or you can see the sun rising. You have to choose which, which one you're going to do. And, and so after 27 years of this, of choosing to see the sunrise, of 27 years of this dark time in prison, Nelson Mandela walks out and he is the undisputed leader of the ANC. He is the undisputed leader of the most important political group in South Africa that is challenging apartheid. And the whole world held its breath because he went into prison as a follower of Jesus who would use violence and had communist leading, leanings. And he comes out of prison and the whole world waits. And what is he going to be? And after 27 years in the dark, he comes out and he is one of God's princes of peace. He has learned to forgive and to reconcile. And he has learned, to, and, and, and that's what this repentance is, right? He, he goes in as a Christian who will use violence, and he turns away from that, and he comes out as a man committed to reconciliation and peace. And he comes out, and he works with the government to set up the first open election. And he's elected president. And you know, remember who his vice president is? A guy by the name of de Klerk, who had been the president before, who had kept him in jail. And you know who sat on the front row when he was inaugurated? His jailer. The guy who locked his door, who locked him into his room every night. That's who was on the front row of his inauguration. And so because Nelson Mandela forsook violence, repented of violence, and became a man of reconciliation, an ambassador of Christ, as, P as Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians, he comes out this new creation in Christ. Because he can reconcile, then the nation reconciles. And the Reformed Church and the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church, the Reformed had been for apartheid, the Methodists had been against it, and the Baptists had said, no, let's just save souls. Because Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela can reconcile, the churches reconcile. And then the people reconcile. They begin the Truth, Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And the whole nation is able to confess its sins and then move on without ripping itself apart at the seams. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say it is because of Nelson Mandela's repentance and turning from violence and embracing Christ's way of, of reconciliation, it is because of that change that the nation of South Africa exists. Repentance is not something to beat ourselves up about. Repentance is the way that we turn from what is ugly and broken in our lives and we embrace that God can change us in ways that are powerful. And inasmuch as we as a church repent of what is broken in our lives and allow others to do the same, we are setting the stage for people to be transformed like Nelson Mandela was. And to have that same type of effect here in Milan. For if we can reconcile here, 
we can reconcile out there. But it begins with repentance. It begins with repentance. That is my prayer for us, that this, this t- dark time uh, that we're in now, this, the darkness of this middle of December when it gets too dark and too cold and it's too long, that this might be the time that sets the stage for greater things to come. That we are able to repent of what breaks us so that we can turn to what God would desire to build in us. Amen.